two, one. Just kidding. It's already started. Hello, my name is Chris Cole. I'm a small time author, and you're listening to my podcast, Chris's Creative Corner. If you tuned in, you probably know that by now. So let's get started. Today, I'm going to answer some questions, and then we're going to get into chapter 15 after quite an explosive chapter 14. We'll see how things turn out. Um, and just a random aside, like, as I'm reading through this, it's been like a year, maybe two since I've read this book. So I'm kind of getting all this information new as well, even though like I know technically what happens. It's like still like, oh, yeah. Oh, huh. Like that kind of stuff. So as I'm reading through that, as I'm reading through, just remember that that this is kind of new for me as well, <laughs> which I think says something about my brain more than anything. Anyway, now it's time for questions for Chris. The first question comes from a writer friend on TikTok. And they asked me, have I ever considered writing under a pseudonym? That's like a fake name for anybody who doesn't know what that means. And the answer is yes, I have. And yes, I will be doing so. <laughs> Um, however, it's not like I'm going to keep it a secret um, because I don't want to work that hard. Technically, I've written under a pseudonym already because Chris Cole is not my full legal name. Um, it used to be, and then it changed when I got married. I did it on purpose. Um, so technically, I have already, but I still go by Chris Cole in most every aspect of my life. Um, my sci-fi series that is coming out in August 2023 will be published under the name Cole Stevens, Stevens with a PH. And the reason for that is because Steven is my middle name. I am Christopher Stephen Cole. And it's with a PH. It's not Stefan, girl from second grade whose name I can't even remember. My middle name is Stephen with a PH. Get over it. Um, so yeah, Cole Stevens. And the reason I did that is because it's like an industry thing where if you write romance and establish yourself as a romance person, and then you suddenly switch to like science fiction, like I'm doing, the romance readers likely will not follow you. So you're catering to a whole new audience who doesn't know you as an established romance writer. But, like, if they look you up and see that you've written romances, apparently they'll be like, oh, he writes romances. I'm not going to read his science fiction. Which I also think is total bullshit. At the same time, I'm writing about some pretty interesting things in my science fiction. Um, not that I'm, like, completely destroying Christianity. Um, but I'm talking about it, and it's, um, like, changing history kind of thing. So it's aliens. Aliens change history because we don't know the history because we don't know the aliens. And then boom, we know the aliens and then we know the real history. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not trying to like destroy religion, or people's faith and beliefs or anything like that. I'm writing a story like calm down. At the same time, there may be people who get like super upset. And are like, who is this guy? Who's this person who's destroying my faith? And I'm allowing him to do so because I have no control over myself, apparently. And they can look me up and find me. Um, so that's a thing, I guess. But since they don't know my full legal name, they can't legally find me, I guess. Whatever. Um, I thought about, um, with my fantasy series, also doing, like... I've thought about doing something with my name, um, like T.S. Eliot or J.R.R. Tolkien or um, other fantasy authors who do like the two initials and then like the last name. That seems to be like a common um, author thing to do. And I don't necessarily know why, but it's like a thing. So I've considered doing that for my fantasy series. I also am considering making the fantasy series that I planned like graphic novels or something. Um, there's so much that I want to do and so many things I want to do. So I'm just like considering all of my options. Anyway, so yes, I will be writing under a pseudonym for my science fiction. 
Um, if I decide to write any more science fiction in the future, I may use my actual name. I may use Cole Stevens. I don't know. I still haven't decided yet, but we'll figure it out. I'm not keeping it a secret, obviously, as I'm talking about the name that I will be publishing under here. So it's whatever. It's not a secret, but it's like a secret for people who don't care. Anyway, the second question is interesting. Um, it was, this question comes from Instagram. Do you try to be more original or to deliver to readers what they want? I originally started out wanting to give readers what they wanted, which is why when I wrote my sci-fi series, I wrote it with a female lead and a male love interest, and I made her straight. And as I have aged and decided that I don't give a fuck what people think, I changed it. All of my books now are queer-themed in some way. Um, they definitely have queer leads. Um, and the story doesn't usually revolve around their sexuality. In Porchlight, we're discovering, like, that's kind of a thing with Casey and Nick and, you know, trying to figure out if Nick is trying to figure out if he can be with Casey. In my other books, the sexuality of the characters, their sexual, sexual and affectional orientation are not, like, the point of the story. I'm trying not to emphasize sexuality or sexual or affectional orientation in all of my books. Obviously, it's a thing for people because there are people who are like, I need to come out, but my family hates queer people, and so it's not safe. And then when they do come out, it's their life is, like, destroyed because their family disowns them or kicks them out or does all these horrible, unreasonable, and unnecessary things. So I understand for a great many people, it is still, to this day, a huge issue to come out in the first place. And Porchlight was kind of my, it was my first romance, it was kind of my coming out romance, and so it has to do with coming out in some ways. Um, obviously, Nick has come out. Um, and it's also not the point of the story. The point is finding happiness, finding love, um, finding yourself. And people do that all the time, whether they come out or not. Usually coming out is a big part of um, finding yourself. But it's not always. So I'm the reason probably that I'm small time and will probably always be quote unquote small time is because I don't try to cater to what the industry wants or what the masses want. Um, I try to tell real stories. Um, and that's just the way it is. Maybe I'll gain more popularity. I don't know. Um, we'll we'll see, you know. And in the meantime, I'm going to write what I want. And I'm going to do that how I want to do it. And if people don't like it, you don't have to read my books. <laughs> it's this crazy thing. So, yeah. That's all for questions for Chris. That's all I'm going to answer. For this episode, anyway. Now, I would like to move on. And we're moving on to chapter 15 of Porchlight. Okay, so chapter 14, they went to Nashville. They started doing their tour. They started getting all of the stuff prepared. And the interview that Nick did a couple chapters back with Tony um, for the Out Gazette um, went to print. And... It did not shine a very flattering light on Casey. And Nick didn't mean for that to happen, but it totally did. And so Casey freaked the fuck out, um, was really upset, and actually um, left a note in the hotel room that said he got his own room and he can't deal with Nick right now. So band drama, and they're not even like well known yet. So that's totally a thing. 
we'll we'll see how this goes. Chapter 15, On the Road. Our success continued to build after the big debut of our album. We performed seven completely sold out shows over the next month. Those moments when I was on stage, I had no cares. I was in the music, singing my soul out. Within the first week, our album sold 500,000 copies. Within a month, the sales had skyrocketed to 7 million. We had become instant celebrities. All our social media accounts blew up. Kennedy was officially replaced as admin for all of them. We had an agent, a makeup artist, and people to haul our equipment. We had, a, we had an agent, a makeup artist, and people to haul our equipment. Then it was the night for us to open for Pentatonix at Madison Square Garden. 20,000 people. Our biggest show yet. I was standing in the wings with the other three, shaking like a leaf. You've got this, Kennedy reassured me, giving my shoulders a squeeze. I took a deep, steadying breath. I know. I mean, it's not like you can see them anyway. Yeah, but they're there. Like, all of them. She looked over her shoulder, but got no support from Casey. Levi gave me a quick thumbs up while psyching himself up behind us. Casey was... I blinked back tears. Kennedy lightly slapped my face. None of that. Now, just remember what we're doing. We've got this incredible music. Just feel it when we get out there. You've got this. The lights changed. Our cue. Oh my god. Kennedy stepped out on stage as planned. The audience went wild. Lights were flashing all over the place. She took her place and began a beat. I nodded my head along. Casey went next to renewed cheers from the crowd. He brushed past me, glancing back slightly before picking up his bass. He began to play in time with the drums. Okay. There. It was our song. I knew this. Levi went next. More cheers. He picked up his guitar and immediately went to town. I couldn't help myself. I grinned. Did I need to pee? No. I felt like a lightning bolt. I held the microphone up to my mouth, and I began to sing. Once, alone, I met my fate in you. Pleading, dying, reckless abandon of your soul. I stepped out on stage, my eyes watering at the intensity of the cheers and the pressure, but I was into the music now. I wasn't shaking. I'm the happy one. You must think I'm beautiful. I just feel like a whiteout. I go into the quiet box. We decided to open with the quiet box because of the heavy bass and drums. I mean, most of our songs had heavy bass and drums, but I really loved this song because it felt like a chant. A ritual chant. I could almost imagine a terrified ritual sacrifice or something, the drums pounding as the natives held them up in front of a giant fire. I was grateful we had decided to open this way. Once I felt the music, I was able to do what I needed to do, and the audience loved it. Throughout our opening set, I spotted Casey turning his back to the audience and taking a drink from a flask inside his vest pocket. We were lucky it was over before it could fully affect him. I hated seeing him like that, but I also wasn't in a place to say anything. After the concert, we were all partying it up with Pentatonix and some VIP fans. Casey was making out with some girl the whole time. Didn't know who she was. After about half an hour of them almost dry humping, they decided to go back to Casey's hotel room. Okay. Now, I didn't follow them. I had been ready to go back to the hotel before they left. I was just using their leaving as an impetus for... Who the hell am I kidding? I followed him to make sure he got to the hotel okay, and I felt like an obsessed little troll because of it. But I stopped following once they got into the hotel. I spent a few minutes outside on my phone just so I didn't chance seeing them in the elevator or something. We continued our tour over the next few months. Sometimes part of the tour was opening for another band, but most of the time we had our own show to do. Our biggest gig was opening for Neon Trees at Wrigley Field in Chicago. Over 40,000 people. But we employed the same strategy for Neon Trees that we did for Pentatonix, and I was able to open the show without letting my nerves get the better of me. Everyone in the band had quit their jobs. 
They had a goodbye party for Levi at his school, and he asked if we could sing at the school. All the kids loved him, and the teachers were sad to see him go. The teacher he worked with cried, and that got all the kids crying too. Even Levi looked a little glassy-eyed. We only sang one song, Sorry. It was the lightest subject matter. When I was in New York, I ended up getting a call from Heather. She left a voicemail asking me about a specific client we had who came in every year but she had never dealt with. I knew all the ins and outs of their stay. My first instinct was to ask Casey what I should do, but we weren't on speaking terms. Or we spoke, but it was only about band stuff. We weren't hanging out socially unless it was as a band. I decided I would send a text. I told her that because no one at the hotel was familiar with the guest's requests, the guest should have to tell them. And if the guest got upset, explain they fired Nick, the last person who knew what was up. I really hoped they did mention I'd been let go because I worked my ass off for that guest. They were going to be very upset if they were given any less special treatment. Of course, Kennedy told me to text her, I don't work there. Suffer, job-stealing whore. Soon we were finishing our tour in Los Angeles for a week, playing a few venues for more sold-out crowds. One night, after one of the concerts, we were in the VIP waiting area when a familiar face came through the door. Tony! I stood up, shocked, and gave him a hug. He squeezed me back with a smile and a soft kiss on the cheek. Everyone, this is Tony Moore. Tony, this is everyone. Levi, Kennedy, Casey. Kennedy met my gaze, and I nodded to confirm what she suspected. Yes, Kennedy, Tony's the guy I was stooping who wrote that article. Her eyes immediately narrowed, but she kept her cool. Casey was in a corner, making out with unidentified fangirl number 35,898,345. At least, it seemed like it. Maybe they were trying to become one person, or she was an alien and was eating him alive, starting with his tonsils. I led Tony over to the couch and sat down, offering him a hit off the bong. No thanks. It may be legal here, but I'm not taking any chances for drug tests when I get back to work. What do you do? How do you know Nick? Freaking Levi. The one time he's curious about me in my life. Oh, we met in Nashville. Tony gave me a small smile and my stomach twisted. We met at the hotel after he'd been recording one night. I actually interviewed him for Out Gazette in Nashville. Did any of you read? We read. Yes. Kennedy's answer, plus me sitting straight backed and wide eyed, probably indicated to him it was a sensitive subject, but Casey overheard. So you're the one! Casey drunkenly detached himself from the girl. He stood and glared at Tony. You made me sound gay. Tony raised his eyebrows, but grinned in a slightly malicious way. You're Casey? I'm sorry you didn't like the article. I only reported what I was told. Casey glowered at me, then grabbed the girl's hand. We're leaving. Tony twiddled his fingers after him. Toodles. I elbowed him, frowning. You didn't have to be like that. What? He's already hella mad at me. I can't believe you put in everything I told you. I thought you were an editor. He threw his head back and laughed, putting an arm around me. Yeah, I'm an editor, and what you told me was awesome stuff. I leaned away from his arm, taking it out from behind me. I thought it would be nice to see you. I was wrong. He held up his hands defensively. Whoa, hey. It's nice to see you, from my perspective. You got a lot of mileage from that article. I saw you on Jimmy Fallon. You're welcome. I'm leaving, too. I'm going back to the hotel. I stood and walked out, but Tony followed me. Hey, Nick, wait. Come on, please. I stopped and turned, arms crossed. What you did to Casey was wrong. I told you, I remember specifically telling you, that it wasn't up to me or anyone to decide for Casey who he was. And yet you did. And you ruined our friendship. He barely even talks to me now. I'm... I'm sorry. He looked genuinely earnest. I didn't mean for that to happen. I just wanted to write a good article. Apart from that bit, did you like it? I was... I was surprised I didn't hear from you. I hadn't thought much about Tony, to be honest. We'd had a hookup, and that was the end of it for me. Of course, I'd been so focused on pursuing Casey that I hadn't followed up with any of the guys who'd shown interest in me. Scott, especially. We'd gotten along really well and hadn't slept together or anything. 
Of course, I knew Tony and I worked well in the bedroom, but I didn't know about anywhere else. I hadn't thought about it. Apparently he had. I... I've been busy. Yeah, being a rock star takes a lot out of you, I imagine. His eyes twinkled, stirring something inside me. I did think about you after our time together. It was really nice. I'll always think about you when I go to Nashville, I think. He smiled. You don't have to think about me now that I'm here. What do you say I give you my best good morning? I don't need to be woken up. It serves many purposes. We found ourselves back in the hotel suite. This time, Casey hadn't gotten permission to have his own room, so his bedroom in the suite was right across from mine. I barely had time to sit down on the bed in my room before Tony pulled my pants down and engulfed me in his mouth. I moaned with pleasure, my hands resting lightly on the top of his head. Suddenly, I felt goosebumps rise through my whole body. I looked around the room for the source of the feeling. Nothing. Then, I looked through the crack in the door and saw a pair of eyes staring right at me. Casey's eyes, and the head of the girl he left with was in his lap. We continued to make eye contact the whole time both our companions pleasured us. Soon I was at my peak, and I had to bite the sleeve of my shirt to keep from crying out as I climaxed. I could no longer see Casey's eyes as Tony got off his knees and gave me a soft kiss. Just like old times, right? I crawled back in the bed and didn't say anything. He was right and wrong. Everything had changed from the first time we had gotten together. I could be recognized on the street now, especially in bigger cities, and I was living in hotels, eating out, and definitely drinking more than I ever had before. But it was also still the same. Tony wasn't Casey. Here I was with Tony, and all I could think about was Casey. Even when I had an orgasm, he was still on my mind. Had he seen me? Did he like it? Did he miss me? Or was all this just another way I was obsessed with a man I had no access to? I felt weight shift on the bed, and Tony moved to stand by the door. Well, it was good to see you too, Nick. My voice was barely more than a whisper. I'm sorry it wasn't how you wanted it to be. I'm just not in the best place right now. Maybe it's a Nashville thing, Tony suggested. Maybe we'll only ever work when you're in Nashville. Maybe. It was good to see you, Tony. I'm glad you came. He let out a soft laugh and raised his eyebrow. Hey, I'm glad you came. And that is the end of chapter 15. Do you feel the awkwardness? I feel the awkwardness. It's awkward AF. So that's everything for this episode. Next episode, we're going into chapter 16. We're just plugging right along. We're going to figure out some answers to some things and get more in-depth into now that they are official rock stars, what that life is like for them. Thank you for tuning in to Chris's Creative Corner, and we'll see you next time.